Let's see. Uh, request to continue the discussion specifically regarding the foundation at 6 and 8 White Oaks Lane to be continued from March 12th to the next scheduled meeting. So 8 o'clock on March 26th. Okay. Okay. Move that the CPDC continue the public hearing um, for the PUD special permit minor amendment of Johnson Woods until Monday, March 26th at 8 p.m. Second. All in favor? I guess I can vote. Yeah, you can, can vote on discussion. procedural things. Okay. Although I haven't consulted <coughs> Robert's rules on that, but I think you can. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> I know one time at town meeting, I, I thought I would have a conflict of interest because I worked for an engineering company that was doing the design of the water plant when those discussions were up. And the opinion of the town manager and council was that I didn't have a conflict of interest as a citizen. I had a right to weigh in on that discussion. Mm -hmm. I understand anyways, but so just because you know, we probably all know somebody who lives in some neighborhood that we're talking about. Yeah, but in this case, it's the person who signs my paycheck. <laughs> also, if you don't feel comfortable, yeah. Yeah. then it's your choice. Okay, so first order of business is going to be the design guidelines. Mm -hmm. The SDG discussion I with design guidelines. So where would you like to start on that? Um... So I received feedback from Tony, which I shared with all of you in Google Drive and then in front of you. Um, Andrew's prepared some different maps, and then we have some members of the public here with different um, information about the history of the area, um, the small H historic, and things that kind of you guys talked about last time. Okay. So however you want to. All right. Yeah, I saw Tony's <coughs> notes. And actually, that's what I was focusing on this week, was the design guidelines and how how those would change in any particular neighborhood. And I just kept thinking about scale. I just, I just looked at all the numbers that we plugged into the design guidelines, and I was thinking, okay, half of this, a third of that, to bring, for example, length the length of the building that we require before they have to start breaking it up, right? Yeah. You're making that smaller, potentially limiting the length of a building in a particular area the way you mentioned where mm -hmm. you start having breaks that you know create light and views mm -hmm. more so than the, the bigger buildings that we've done so far so, and uh, and the roof line thing uh, yeah it didn't occur to me that we didn't have specifics on what a sloped roof should or shouldn't do mm -hmm. we were just trying to hide what we felt were going to be commercial roofs Right. You know, you're yeah. going to get a flat right. roof, and yeah. if they didn't put a parapet up, you're going to see that roof as it mm -hmm. did things around elevator penthouses. And that's kind of what I was thinking about this week. So my next step is going to be to start looking at the actual numbers and doing some sketches and figuring out at least what I think the numbers are, and then we can throw those out there and let people react to that scale. Mm -hmm. So we have Tony's email. I didn't put it on the web because it has like your personal information on it, but I can we can pull it up and we can go through it if that's something that your guys are interested in doing. Um, yeah, it's as it's as good a point to start in. Is that okay with you, Tony? Yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay. So do you want to walk us through your thought process on this, Tony? Not to put you on the spot, but... But you successfully did so. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I read the guidelines, it seemed to me that we were the guidelines were designed for large buildings, but commercial building, well, commercial and residential. That's why you've got your limitations of 300 feet, your non-roof, and so forth. Um, the other point was that, well, the first point is that 
with 14 Chapin Ave, what you're looking at now is uh, every small lot in um, in the DSGD, the downtown, downtown Smart Growth District, can be a multifamily, provided they meet the 50-foot uh, lot width or frontage. Mm -hmm. Because now we can and meet the 20 units per acre, but that's basically one unit every 2,000 square feet. So a 4,000 square foot could easily be a two-family. Um, and so the beginning is basically the only things that would prohibit that would be the roof lines, um, the siding materials, because most people, if you're putting up a two-family, you're going to use vinyl siding is my guess. But that'd be easy enough to circumvent. Uh, make sure they have parking that's fenced in, but most of it would be. Um, a tree. Make sure you have a tree on the lot. Uh, the above ground electrical lines. I'm not certain what it would take to bury electrical lines. It's pretty expensive. Yep. And same with the utilities. And the question is, is that something that the board slash town are looking to mm -hmm. allow? Do we want to allow all of the single families basically on Green Street to be able to, to be converted into two families? But so, but to clarify though, anything less than four would nice. require that the state approve us, you guys granting a waiver. Right. So, and I don't know if that, like, like you mentioned, if it meets the minimum density of 20 units per acre, they might be amenable to it like they were with 14 Chapin. Right. But there's no guarantee of that going. Well, the waiver is granted by the board versus the state, correct? But the state had to approve us modifying yeah. their definition of multifamily. Okay. To yes. allow the waiver. But they, but they have already, in my mind, they've already done they so. They did it for that one project based on some of the specifics of that project. I'm not okay. sure that that would carry. I wouldn't assume that, <clears throat> that would carry forward to every. I wouldn't expect consistency. Property the downtown. Right. right. Okay. In my mind, it was what? granted once. They basically said, "Yep, you can waive your definition." I don't. I didn't read it that way at all. Okay. No. Um, and I would never hang my hat on that. No. All right. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. But I think the point is still valid in thinking about um, other conditions, um, like at 14 Chapin, <coughs> where maybe it's not a two-family and probably not uh, Green Street because the lots are, are so small, but other places around where um, where it, it may make sense. It, it may make sense to have a, a, a three family or a four four units, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but built more in sort of the context of um, of a typical residential on the edge, mm -hmm. as opposed to what these design guidelines generally are, or, you know, really sort of commercially focused, right? Okay, I'm, I'm a little confused. The, um, as I understand it, our um, existing guidelines, as approved by DHCD or the, the DSGD, specify a minimum of four family. Four units. Um, four units, yeah. But the state um, definition of multifamily allows three family. Mm -mm. No. The state is for our. Our definition and the state's match but the state allowed this board to grant a waiver to allow three units at 14 Chapin Avenue because the overall density exceeded the 20 unit per acre minimum okay. that they set forth <coughs> okay I, um, thought, I thought that the, the, the state definition of multifamily allowed three family or for, three units for the 40 R it's four units or more yeah. okay yeah do you guys mind if I just open it up to public comments as well? No. It's, it's more of a dialogue. Yeah, of course. You know, just wait until the end or something. So if you have something you want, just weigh in. <laughs> you know. uh, this is in light of, uh, just, just as an open question here, this is in light of a property that turns over, that is sells or is somehow damaged, like tree falling on a house that needs to be built. Uh, can somebody who currently has a two family Continue to have a two-family. Yes. Okay. But if for some reason somebody buys a parcel 
not just here, but someplace else in town, with a larger, that's in, in a smart growth area or whatever. Uh, they then, if they're taking it and demolishing what's in place, must put up the density that is. No, I mean, technically. Dialogue. That's where. No, no, technically, you can voluntarily <coughs> demolish what you have and build the same thing. Um, okay. And then you also have the business fee zoning that you can use, so you could build something commercial, or you have the downtown smart growth district, so you could build a multifamily or a mixed use. Right. So you you have a range of options. You, your rights to continue your your existing use expire if the use is defunct for more than two years. So if if the building burns down and you don't rebuild it for two years, right. or if you knock it down and don't rebuild it for two years, right. and you wanted that two family, you more or less have lost your rights to that and you have to comply with zoning. Right. It's a little more complicated and legal and nuanced than that. But right, but then um, if there is a third of an acre or less, there's no way you can put a four unit building in that place, right? Because you have a density problem. A third of an acre? Or uh, less, let's, let's say it's... So 8,000 square feet, mm -hmm. no, sorry, no. half of that. Four like like 11,000. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Twelve thousand. So, yeah. Like fourteen. Yeah. Would be yeah. more like a third um, of an acre. Third of an acre is like fourteen thousand square feet. I yeah. think you can see what happened with Chapin, where they were trying to do something bigger, and it just wasn't function. Right. We were looking at not only the building. We we're like, well, you just can't make the parking and the movements work, and and that drove it down in size. That's why we pushed that size. Down. So reasonableness comes into play of that. Yeah, I think we, we can look at something and the engineer can say, you can't make drainage work, or we can say, you can't make parking work, or, you know, there's some other factor, that, or maybe it's a fire safety issue. The fire department says, you just can't put that there. So that we can be reasonable about it. I'm just wondering, because um, I wanted to do a little talk about the history, because I heard uh, Dave was saying, what's the history of this area at the mm. last meeting? And Pam wanted to make a little presentation on what we all thought about the guidelines. I wonder if we should go first, and then you do your talk. Sure, uh, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, yeah. fine. Is that okay? Yep. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, should they be announcing their name and yeah. address? Yeah, just give us your name and address when you do your presentation and make sure you've signed in so we can properly spell it into the minutes. Okay. <laughs> Sarah Mubalakis, my husband Tom, um, and we, um, we live on Maple Ridge Road and we also own 28 Green Street. And um, uh, ever since this, uh, the project started um, and the uh, lines started to get together, um, you know, stories started coming out, you know, and people saying, you know, this, that, this thing, you know, like, oh, that way, that's really interesting, that's a bit more about it. Um, I think, like, oh, oh, I don't, has everybody here heard of Martha Greenwood and seen and heard about the cemetery plot in Laurel Hill? No? Give a picture. Um, so, um, Martha Greenwood, um, all the company is old enough, so over there. Martha and her husband bought the land from the end of Haven Street across High Street up Green Street about 19, I can say like 65-ish because um, of the train coming to Reading and they had been, uh, they, they lived in Newton and they had two successful stores, there was both here in Newton and also in Boston and um, they they moved up this way. He was uh, working at a grocery store at the end of Union Street. Correct me if I say anything wrong. You know a lot more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was only like a quarter of it. I don't want to make a mistake, but I, I, I intended to do a PowerPoint presentation, but some, I lost my internet. But um, this is a map that's from 1866, and it shows you all the undeveloped area. There's actually no Green Street at this time, and, and it says just land in TT uh, Greenway. Um, so, uh, Martha Greenwood was a descendant of the Monroe family from the North Shore, and um, her mother is in Laurel Hill, they're sort of in that area or whatever. Um, so, they move here. Shortly after her husband dies, once they start building some properties, um, the story that I always heard was, uh, and it's, I think most of the historical papers that, that you guys gave me, was that Martha had those little, all the little houses. Um, 
from the historical inventory that just shows the scraps of the little bit about houses. But um, actually, and I, had, and I brought some of the old maps, you can see she owned a really large swath of land, many properties. And so one of the things that I found that I think is really interesting was her obituary. And that was what really made me want to do a deep dive into all of this. Um, and I can be a human PowerPoint. But you know how this picture, which is the foot of Green Street, and you can see all the little houses there, is directly related to this picture. <laughs> it's a really good story. I found so many great stories. I'm just going to tell you a few because I know you can Here's just a quick snapshot of the cemetery plot of Jenny Greenwood. And if you Google Jenny Greenwood Reading, there's a couple of websites where it comes up. Um, pretty amazing. Um, and so it's, it's the Greenwood family plot where Martha, her husband, um, her son, her daughter, they both died of measles. And uh, so in any event, um, to show you the next map. But, so she built all those little houses, but she also built two huge, ten, well, two large tenement houses at the foot of High Street, sort of that whole area where the auto body clinic is all the way down, mm -hmm. two tenement houses. Um, she, all around the end of Haven Street was her property. And at the time of her death in her obituary, um, it says that she was the largest property owner in Red, which I think is pretty amazing. So I figured there had to be more to the story. Um, and I, between Ancestry.com, Newspaper.com, the Writing History Realm, the Battle of Middlesex Registry of Deeds, um, I was able to, 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 to put a lot more together. And the thing that was so interesting about the whole recent area about, um, was it was like these parallel stories coming up, the stories of who owned these houses. And, and oftentimes, people owned more than one. It was kind of like somebody would get two and bundle one together, or they'd have one on Bull Street, and one on Green Street, one on Ash Street. Um, people were forming trusts, which I thought was kind of surprising back in the early 1900s. And then there were all the tenants there. When I printed out the census reports for 1919, uh, 19, 1890, I think it is, 1910 and 1920, just seeing who was there. It was really fascinating uh, that the people who lived on those in there were primarily Irish, Canadian, uh, German, Russian, uh, Scottish, <coughs> and uh, they were, uh, and their occupations were shoe cutter, brush maker, washerwoman, machinist, shop clerk, tie cutter, railroad man, watchman, mailman, you know. They were basically all the people that um, were working in all this industry. So, you know, the train comes in, Reading changes from being agrarian to industrial, and they need all these people. So, these people from Boston that are living in horrible conditions are more than happy to come out here to Reading and live in Martha Greenwood's house. So, this seemed to be Martha Greenwood's um, um, style of real estate development was to create this housing, uh, rental housing. Um, and then she lived on Linden Street. Um, so, I guess I'll skip up to a couple of the stories then. Um, the big story, I think one of the big stories is Thomas Black. I don't know if you've heard of Thomas Black, Black's Block. Yeah, that was the biggest building in the corner there. So here, here I just took a picture right here. This was Black's mm. Block, it was right there in the Haven Street. And then this is Black's Block today, what's left of it. And uh, I believe that he actually wrote Martha Greenwood's obituary because um, it didn't include the normal things that you would put in an obituary, such as, you know, the fact that she had lost two children, maybe where she had come from, her parents and all that. It pretty much mostly commented on, I'll read it to you, the most widely known lady in this vicinity died at her home on Linden Street, uh, cancer of liver. Uh, she was a native of writing, married Thomas Greenwood in South Boston. Together they kept the Cambridge car office in Logan Square. Um, they also kept a grocery store near the depot that was burned five or six years ago. Mrs. Greenwood had a remarkable faculty for business, helped her husband earn every dollar for the large property he had accumulated at his death. Um, he died in 1871. I think he was about 44 or something. 
At the time of her death, uh, Mrs. Greenwood held more real estate and money than any person in town. Her husband gave her one half of the property and a life interest in the rest. Two or three years ago, Thomas Black, who had married the young lady who was a protege of Mrs. Greenwood, bought the rights of the heirs, and now he and his wife came into possession of the whole property, which Mr. Black proposes to improve as fast, as far, and as much as he can see a way to do so. <laughs> the interesting story was that, uh, <coughs> that the Greenwoods actually adopted this young girl, Mabel. Um, she was about 13, and I think that Martha was trying to teach her the ways of real estate. However, I have a sense that Thomas Black <laughs> saw an opportunity here to marry <laughs> the daughter of this woman, and, um, and at which point um, he, he kind of went on a roll. He was known for doing a lot of the houses. Um, uh, we would end. He's like one of the people at this house moved here. Thomas Black moved this house. But um, so anyway, I couldn't find them for a little while. The interesting story is like, I'm Googling away in newspapers.com and I see Mabel is in bankruptcy court. <laughs> not too far, not too far you know, along. And she's, next thing you know, she's in New York State and she's with her mother. And I couldn't find Thomas Black until I finally found his death certificate. And he was in Texas at the age of 77 running a broom manufacturing company. <laughs> and, uh, and the interesting thing is, is that on Mabel's uh, thing, it says she's divorced, however, he doesn't say he's divorced, so I, I think they divorced. She went to, um, uh, where was it? Uh, what's MO? Missouri. 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 Yeah, she went to Missouri with her daughter, Blanche. And uh, so that story I thought was amazing, just to sort of wrap up the whole Greenwood thing. But the <laughs> other stories that came up for, 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 is what happened after she died, and all of that land got dispersed. Some of it got sold, but a lot of it sort of got gifted to some to certain people. Um, and so the two tenement houses, um, there was a, a man named uh, Nathan Wolpert, who was a Russian immigrant, um, 16 years old. He's in Boston working as a peddler. Uh, a few years later, he's working as a pie filling salesman. A few years after that, he buys one of the tenement buildings, and he has formed the Reading Preserving Company which I don't know anything about. I couldn't find anything on it. Do you know anything about it? No, not at all. <laughs> and it's on one of the maps, in tie and writing, right, in preserving company. But he not only buys that building, he buys the tenement house, and he buys the first house on Green Street. I think it's like 13 Green Street. He lumps them all together, and he forms a trust. Uh, and the trust is for the benefit of his, his, um, his parents. They get $30 a month in some place in Pennsylvania. And his three daughters, and it's to make sure they all go to college. This is in 1920-something. I think that was pretty amazing. But the story uh, of the, that I was showing you of the hotel that I found the most interesting is that, so Martha Greenwood, I was looking at her family tree. She has the Monroe's, the, the worst, there was a family called Tilling Gast. But just, right. I never heard of that name before. Well, uh, when you look on one of the maps, it'll say land by Fowl, Fowl and Pierce Trust or something. So on the left side, as you go up Green Street, the first three little houses there, I think it's 12, 14, and 16, were put into this trust. You can read the trust in Green Street it goes into great detail um, to the people, uh, a Josephine telling gas. And she, she gets this much money, and another telling gas, and a Pierce, and this. And it turns out to be this woman who's a widow, her sister never married, um, the son whose both parents were died young. And um, the interesting thing is that Josephine's living at the, um, uh, what is it, what's that hotel? I look up. The Bowdoin Hotel, does that sound right in Boston? Could be, I don't know. I was mm -hmm. that before, but I don't know. Let me just double check. So I thought to myself, who lives at the Bowdoin Hotel? The Brunswick, she's living at the Brunswick Hotel, mm -hmm. which was this really swanky thing. It's right next to the Trinity Church. And apparently in the late 1800s, early 1900s, you know, like you had like, um, uh, what's his name, Mark, uh, the writer of Tom Sawyer, Twain. Mark, Mark Twain, Mark Twain, the pre presidents, all these <coughs> Samuel that Clemens. all hang out at the Brunswick. And so I look on the list of other people and I see Mary Eaton is living there, Mary Gold is living there. So I kind of got the sense that the Brunswick Hotel for $25 a week is sort of like the Brooksby Village of Reading. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I, I, 
<laughs> I'll have to say my 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 one story I'll end with, and I have I have so many stories. I, there are so many stories because it's all so easily accessible now. You, you know, you can look up who owns the house. You can look up the census. You can look up on their family trees. I mean, it's, it's amazing their occupations and stories. But Nathan Wolpert, the Russian who did the uh, Red and Preserving Company, he um, bought his bought the property from. Make sure I get this exactly right because it's such a good story. Francis Thompson, president of the Moxie Nerve Food Company. Mm -hmm. Yep. Did you know that? No, but I mean, Moxie, I, I, I know Moxie. Moxie. Yeah. yeah, they had bought the property and they were considering making that um, manufacturing plant. Mm -hmm. I just think that was one of the great, such a great story. Um, but they decided to go to Jamaica Plain. And uh, so, well, and you use my book. I didn't really know much about it myself, but I feel like I should take it. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I, I just, I have so many stories. Oh, I know what I wanted to show you, which is just the progression of. Now, all those little houses were cookie cutter, weren't they? They're exactly the same. And they were worker houses. And they were all built by Martha Greenwood. Mm -hmm. The name of the builder, but um, I, I don't know who was at 14 Green Street, but at one time, 10, it was a two family house and 10 people lived in one side. <laughs> I don't even know, and they, they were all from Canada. Um, you can imagine the outrage today if somebody tried that. <laughs> <laughs> or for that matter, the outrage that probably took place in town when this lot, when this area went from agrarian to did they have any zoning at all? what they did. Not until 1942. Yeah. But not that what she laid out was bad. You know, no. the sort of worker housing yeah. surround, you know. It's right near the train. Transportation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Transportation oriented <laughs> development, which is what right. we're kind of <laughs> trying yeah. to do. Nothing new there. So Walkable during, downtown. during that time was the other side of the tracks, was that when the that was all at rail yard? Or had the On rail the, yard. What side of the tracks are you talking about? On Lincoln Street. Lincoln yeah, Street. the Lincoln Street yeah. side. Right, that was all a rail yard. So was the rail yard gone by then? I mean, because it's a, it sounds like living it next to a rail yard I, back I, then I, I was actually, not a nice place to live. I just wanted to show this was kind of interesting. So here's the street. I mean, these are the houses. This yeah. one's gone. These are the ones that still stand. Um, this was one of the tenement houses, and that's the second one next to it. So that's how it looked um, in the late 1800s. And then <clears throat> this was when. Uh, Nathan Wolpert, when he broke up his thing, he sold this end to a gas station. But this is actually the original tenement house, just sort of reworked. I don't think I can pass this around. It's kind of interesting to see. That's right out of the Wolverine book. Thank you. And this is just one of the maps that shows the extent of Market Greenwood's homes. Um, Suffice it to say the Reading Historical Commission is aggressively recruiting staff. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> this, I just think is, uh, I have to share because when Tom and I bought the house, we lived on Warren Avenue, and uh, we had an elderly neighbor who came down, true story, he had polio, but he's still low, and uh, he rolled down to the driveway, and he takes this photo album on his lap, and he opens it up, and he pulls this picture away from its four ace art corners, <laughs> and he says to me, I lived in that house. This is me in front of it. And he was born in that, in that house in 1909. And uh, but I love the way it has a nice, nice run lamp post in there. And you can see, you can see the end of the black block um, there. So I'm just going to turn that around. So um, so anyway, my whole, my whole, my one of the things that this sort of brought me to is um, that's just the best story. What we found by being out with our alliance was this whole. And um, I can't stop thinking about more ways to do that because the people, everybody there, um, it's sort of a common feeling that we've all you know, met and sort of thing. And, and, uh, and, and, um, and uh, Lorraine even brought up what about the other side? You know, what about the history on the other side? And one of the, I have so many ideas going around in my head, but. 
I may not even use this, this, this thing, but as far as the design guidelines go, uh, I know Pam's going to speak to that, but I would hope that, you know, that it would include some sort of preserving of this neighborhood feel. I would hope that people might be incentivized, you know, fix it up. Like Pam always says, add some window boxes, you know, add more things and make the, make the, um, get some sidewalks on the other side sort of thing. And then maybe we could get some sort of, um, they have these great signs I've seen in different parts. They're like these all-weather signs, like at the depot area facing the foot of Green Street. They could sort of have a, a little capsule of the history of the area. Because I really feel like, you know, more than everybody thinks, like when we moved here, or years ago? I don't know. It was like it's a great place because he worked on the, um, that highway and it was this one. It's like a bit the, the community to come and raise your kids. The schools were good, but now I see uh, the importance of preserving some of this historical element, just so people have a sense of what the history of Brighton and something like that is a way incorporated into every day. You know, to have some signage, maybe, um, maybe call it Reading's Greenwood area. <laughs> No, I just think of different things. I just feel like it would be a shame to let it all just go away and um, history be lost. And I, and I think there's more to history because I can't believe that just that area is the largest um, landowner in, in Reading. So, I mean, at the time, so it's at understandable. The time, sure. You know, at the time, and uh, yeah, and, and it's just a uh, for. Uh, what did we find out for you, Pam? I found out some stories about the house. Yes. Uh, yeah. The house was. Oh, I know. It was so intimate right there. See the part about how our houses were bundled? Bundled legally? Yeah. Well, so they were my, house, my, my house, the Woolworth's house, and Ace Art were all bundled at one point because I think um, when Ace, when, when Lester Riley uh, sold his business to his great nephew, the great nephew purchased those two houses, and I think it was planned just you know, to, to, to have in case they wanted to expand. Then ASAR ended up moving over by Walkersburg Drive. And so then a developer in town, John Rivers, bought that same plot. But he ended up foreclosing on the whole thing, and because of that, that's how we all, everything got broken back up again. I just thought it was funny, because I started doing the research on mine, and then next thing I know it says, and it, and it includes the two other properties. And so, and that happened in many places. There was a family named, um, uh, Wallace and Emma Williamson Clickies, and they owned four houses, three houses on Great Street and two on Gould. This is interesting to me. Yeah, that came up over and over, you know, people, uh, and a lot of families. There was many generations. Um, Lorraine's house was owned by the, well, three generations of the McGuire family, uh, Gracemen. Uh, just really interesting sure. okay. stories. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, Fast forward. <laughs> yeah. um, I address things a little bit differently, um, more in terms of I don't have copies for everybody, so I will give them to Julie to pass on and on this drive, if we could. Share one. In the 20 Gold Street folder. Does it Yep. We can share two. That. Okay. Uh, no, <laughs> no. The, the date. Um, yeah. I can do it better. Yeah. That one. Okay. Now, I, if you want to copy that over, that's fine. But make sure I get my drive back. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So I took a slightly different approach. Um, having talked to Pamela Adrian, 87 Ash Street, they will know me by now. I walk into stores and people know who I am. So obviously, people are looking at the uh, meetings online. Uh, I took a, the approach of going back through all of the notes, all of the concerns list, all of the desires list, and boiled them down into what I felt were pretty good guidelines. And I didn't get too specific on many of these items, but enough so that it touched on what the hot buttons were, and I think these are items that should be considered. Setbacks, we still feel very strongly that there should be a 15-foot setback from property lines. And I, I define terms later in this presentation. 
as uh, a dwelling. It is a residential property uh, in this zone that we're talking about. And I applied it primarily to the Google Green Street area, but I feel very strongly that design guidelines should be uniform across the town for all 40R projects. Uh, exterior design lines, uh, you have uh, touched on that, the breakup of the front so that for uh, big masses of buildings that there is not a contiguous line, but that it's broken. So I, whatever terms you use, we feel very strongly that's a good move. Height, uh, I term this in, in uh, percentages rather than floors, primarily because some buildings might be uh, constructed after drilling so that there might be a garage down below or there might be a uh, somewhat of a subfloor. Uh, so I really thought in terms of the buildings that are part of the new development should not exceed 15% of the surrounding dwellings. And I was very specific about that. And this is something we fought very hard to have you hear us about. We understand that we can't always observe this. Elevation as it applies to height. If the new structure is topographically lower than an abutting dwelling, then the height should be uh, designed, uh, can be designed with more floors. So that's that's the whether it's a three or whether it's a four floor it depends <coughs> on its relationship. In all of these things, I'm talking about the relationship to those dwellings that abut. You know, we've never used stories as a deciding factor. That was something that the public sort of started throwing out. Well, like and, and, well and there's a caution there because if somebody has a 15-foot ceiling, it's quite a bit the different. MF Charles building is only three stories, but it's 45 feet tall. Right. Right. So we've never used stories as the guiding factor. We've always had a hard, you know, I'm just physical height. I'm pressing that home. Yep. Um, elevation, uh, talked about that. Parking. Uh, this is something that hadn't been touched on, and I know it continues to be a problem. And my recommendation, since these are 40R developments, is that there be some concession made for the commercial component of the building, so that either in a curb cut to allow parking or allocation for parking, because if you've got, even if you've got an accounting office, you have, you may have one person who's an accountant and two people who work, works for him or her, and then where are they going to park? So I feel very strongly that if you're going to have a commercial space as part of a 4 yard development, that there needs to be some concession made, some thought about, and I know that in the Tregora property, that in fact, with the curb cut, is one thing that they handled it that way. But that needs to be pressed home for any uh, new development. Site, uh, so that's part of it. I'm sorry, can you just yes. clarify on that so that you want them to have a curb cut, or what is it exactly about this curb cut that, that there needs to be some concession, some permission for the commercial property uh, renter, <coughs> uh, whatever business it might be, to have some parking. Right now, there isn't anything in Travorts in the in the internal parking area that is designated for either the person who's renting or the people who may come and go to do business there. Okay, so you're, you're talking about having allocated parking for any yes. commercial. Yes, yes, I think that needs to be factored in. If this is going to be successful, uh, one of the concerns for many of the businesses in Reading is they can survive or fail based on whether or not there is adequate parking, and I think we need to be mindful of that. So it's just, that's, I'm just throwing it out. Mm -hmm. That is maybe something that we should be considering how that happens. That's that's not in my mm -hmm. view. Can I just, um, yes. I just want to throw one comment out there. Yep. What we learned, and I don't know what the current state of affairs is, but we learned what we learned after the 30 Haven Street was developed, the old Atlantic supermarket, was that um, the parking that they provided in the garage, I think it was 78 parking spaces for 53 units, that the tenants, the residential tenants, did not use all those parking spaces. 
So it's a little bit of a guessing game to understand how much of the parking that's being built will be used by the residential uh, tenants. Right. Okay, so the people living in the dwelling units. So residential <laughs> will absorb some amount of parking. It's kind of a guess. And then in the 30 Haven situation, they had such a, I don't, I don't want to overstate it, but they had extra parking. Yeah. So they began to make that available to the commercial tenants, which um, got to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It was a strange way of getting there, but they right. got there. Whatever the formula may or may not be, there needs to be consideration in order for business to, businesses to succeed. Because if that's the bottom line here that you have, residential apartments and you have a commercial component you don't want that commercial component to be empty and if you provide parking in one way or another however minimal that you you're going to hopefully succeed i just don't know if the regulations drive that or if the marketplace drives it and I don't that, either. that's hard to know we talk about it a lot right we call it right sizing the parking right. We all want to mm -hmm. get to the same goal, which is to right size parking so that we have enough parking to but support. But at a minimum, I, yeah, I, I, mean, I, I get the point. I think everybody understands that that's sort of a, an art as much as it is science. Mm -hmm. But at a minimum, just following up on this, the regulation should incorporate the capacity for CPDC, for the permitting authority, to consider and discuss the ad adequacy of the parking with respect to those issues. However, the particular project gets there, um, but as long as the, the there is language in the in the design guidelines to enable a discussion about how the particular project gets there, that's at, at a minimum what's important. Mm -hmm. Just you know, so that there's a discussion of the fact to accommodate the residents in the neighborhood and accommodate the commercial um, the commercial businesses, and then it could be figured out on a case by case basis. We do do that. Although, we, we, in some instances, we might be putting our, the way that the, the design guidelines are, are written, we might be putting ourselves in a box because if, um, if someone came along with a commercial development that we thought was going to generate or need more parking mm. than sort of it, that's in the area, you know, right now, I mean, especially the one on Main Street, the, the, the um, uh -huh. the, the retail uh, where, uh, the Sunoco the, the space is so small they're really not I mean it's not going to drive a ton of ton of parking um, requirement but I guess where I was where I was thinking is w the way that we have it structured it will be it would be end up being more of a fight if we think that they need to allocate the 1.25 plus another 50 spaces or something um, uh, for the commercial. Wait, so that hasn't been. What, what, what exactly are you, are you saying? What does well, that when, mean? when you think about structured parking, a surface lot is about $30,000, I think. Per space? Per space, yeah. right? Yeah. You put it in a garage and you're well over $100,000, right? Per space. So, per space, yeah. five, five commercial spaces, that's a half a million dollars added to a project. And you can see what the impact of that is. Not that we need to concede everything to these to developers, but you can. That's real impact, right? Mm -hmm. Every time you ask for an additional affordable unit, that's real right. impact to their their bottom line. They'll just walk away. Right. So we don't want to build more parking than we need, especially surface parking, because that's just not environmentally sensitive and unnecessary. We do need to understand our parking supply better, mm -hmm. how it's used, and, and we need to, we, we don't want to have language that's so firm that it says, you know, five commercial spaces, and then they look at it and go, that's a half a million dollars. We can't do that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But consideration, absolutely. Consideration yeah. is what I'm saying. Just to give you an example, this is really why it came to my mind, is that I was at the meeting for 65 Main Street, and they talked about having a UPS. Well, the UPS has the person that works there, UPS office. Because I go to the one up in Stoneham, has a UPS office, the person who's there, sometimes more than one. There are mailboxes, so you've got that traffic coming in, but you also have people picking up and dropping off packages. So as a result, they probably use three spaces up front up in Stoneham. So if you transfer or create that same kind of office mm -hmm. down here on Main Street, 
And the only parking space is across the street. Now we added three spaces in front of the building, though. And I was very pleased about that because <laughs> that three, that was an excellent move. Uh, and the other thing is the concern if there's parking across the street or illegal parking of any sort or parking where the convenience store needs to have his folks coming in and out, then we have the same kind of problem all over again. It's, it's you have a safety issue with people trying to cross the street and you have a business that can't succeed because of the lack of parking. So I'm just saying. No, no that's, all, that's all good. Though the other piece of this, I, I, you know, there is, I, I'm not picking on a, a business owner here, but I am, I will. And I don't know if they're still in town. You know, I'm gonna say, right, 10 years ago, um, maybe less, there was a vacuum cleaner repair shop where um, Havana Seafood is now, where the sushi place is right. now, or maybe right next door. Yeah. And I remember talking to someone um, and they were complaining that uh, that business owner had no parking um, uh, so that people could bring their vacuum cleaners in to be repaired. And, well, they were absolutely right, but why on earth did that business owner pick the mo the busiest intersection <laughs> in Reading to have a have a have a have a, um, a business that required you to lug a vacuum cleaner out of your car to go bring bring it have it be repaired? So the reason why I bring that up is that you know what we we want to be able to. <clears throat> support business and have thriving businesses but it they also need to their right each each space has some limitations and and maybe the ups where they have you know that kind of high turnover is not not a great use for uh, um, a downtown use or maybe it is and there's going to be enough people in the downtown that 75 percent of their their business is from walk-in traffic and or mm -hmm. Park one place and link well, to different UPS places. UPS has evolved where they'll use those smaller vans now, especially in urban areas, right. and so they can get they can get into the garage, and we've got some spaces right. in the garage. Right. So that project could accommodate it. We we took some of that into consideration. But I, I guess well, a lot I don't of want to get hung up on it. Yeah. I think your yeah. point, no, but your, your point is well taken. Right. Yeah. We need to yeah. consider the commercial parking. And yeah. we want the businesses to succeed, yeah. and I'm saying let's enhance that opportunity for them. But, but I guess all my point about it is, is to the extent that we're we're considering design guidelines for those portions of the of the downtown um, smart growth district that abut residential neighborhoods, the design the, that specific design guideline has to incorporate the requirement and the responsibility to however you define it or or quantify it to do consideration to the need of the residential uh, neighbors who are there such that they can they are not adversely affected mm -hmm. by whatever this project is going to be. I, I, I don't know how to do that, but, but all I'm saying is the guidelines need to say consideration with respect to parking for a project that abuts a, a residential area has to give due consideration. Uh, you have to be satisfied uh, before you approve it that due consideration is giving to the needs of the residential community and the safety of the residential community Agreed. so that you know you, you <clears throat> can conceivably succeed in that fight right. if you end up having to deny it for that reason. I guess that's all yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm just being thoughtful about these yeah. kinds of things. Safety mm -hmm. was another one that had been a hot button for us. Um, and I think in, in one of the meetings, uh, that we had recently, there was a discussion of, well, uh, the plans have been sent to the fire chief and he hadn't responded. I think what we need in terms of safety is to ensure that there is uh, adequate water and that there's adequate access for any fire equipment uh, and that it doesn't rely on coming into Lorraine Wilbert's backyard Right, well, okay, the, so the building code dictates what access around the building looks like and, right. and how big a building can be depending on what that access looks like. Right. And then the fire chief always looks at that. That's not Does to say that. Sign off? Absolutely. Well, the fire chief also, just to correct like a misunderstanding, had reviewed and commented on those plans three times by the time that came up in the meeting. So okay. that was misinformation at the hearing. Okay. Um, I just wanted to 
If you think about the, the 40B on Lincoln, the fire chief expressed concerns with the early designs about whether they could access it with their apparatus. Okay. Now they might very well go to, uh, was that Washington? Yeah. On the back side of it, mm -hmm. and try to fight it from that side, especially if they're trying to keep the fire off of you know the residential. Exactly. Fire. So they might want to, but the building code is really strict about what kind of access they have, and they look at it and say we can't get to this or we can get to this. So that's well, we were just yeah. looking for that kind of assurance. Um, designs, general and final approvals. Okay, uh, that paint building keeps sticking in my mind. Uh, it wasn't on the original plans, so occupancy should not be granted unless and until all sign-offs are provided, including the design aspects. Uh, this applies to exterior designs and materials approval, which obviously the paint building would never have flown uh, by you guys if you had seen and, and compared the original drawings to what actually got presented. Yeah, so I don't know that we can actually control color. We can ask for like if you want to paint your house pink, I couldn't tell you not to do that. Absolutely. I we, it was definitely not that, the color. But, but what I'm saying is, yeah. if the original plan showed brick and what the final product was, was A, a different material, and B, different from the drawings, they're not meeting plan. Sure, that's a significant change. So right. let's say they went from brick to a, a clapboard yeah. or something. That's a significant non-approval. We have specific conditions in our approvals now that say that talk exactly about materials style um, plans that have been approved yeah um, I mean, that was our first one and they're coming <laughs> back some of these applicants are coming back yeah. to show you what their final yeah. selections yeah. are going to be we've asked for physical samples now and that's yeah. what they're held to especially when we do like that's uh, awnings and yeah. canopies that's yeah outstanding yeah. but the issue is once we issue the building permit and they start if they do something different do we shut down the project you won't win in court if you told them that's too pink, right? You just won't win, and that's the problem. What are we going to do? We're going to spend our legal counsel money defending, you know, ourselves. And, and to stop a construction a project one. and its tracks and potentially put the town at risk for a lawsuit? That's a huge one. As an architect, if I walk onto a site and I see a dangerous condition, I can notify the owner, but I can't tell them to stop working. Right? And it's my seal that says what they're supposed to be doing. But mm -hmm. I can't tell them to stop working because the liability that the contractor will incur yeah. by stopping is greater I than just, my just think responsibility. The, the pink building is laughable. I, I just, I'm appalled that it's even there. Yeah, well, hopefully they'll paint it soon. Yeah. <laughs> That's but it, but it's in, in response, to what we do, what we now do is instead of just relying on the color sample and the the name of the color and and all of that, um, which we had in that case, mm -hmm. um, uh, which wasn't the same as what went in, um, actually required them to bring in samples to be approved. Like this is how that color looks on that right. that um, material. that material because. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right, we've always yep. painted, all of us have painted those ugly yellow rooms and said, well, that's not the way the chip looked, right? <laughs> yeah. I know, every single one in this room. <laughs> uh, landscaping. Uh, if a new development structure is in close proximity to dwellings, uh, its features should be softened by landscaping, not hardscaping. Uh, this can include flower boxes, hanging planters, trees, shrubs, ground covers, Oh, that's a misspelling. Sorry. <laughs> Should be <Growing> round. <laughs> Grown <laughs> covers. Growing, growing <laughs> covers. Uh, and uh, my suggestion is, if there are expanses that are big enough, and certainly a barrel is big enough, to make use of the Reading Garden Club's Adopt an Island program uh, would be a good move because it would integrate the more sure. community, which is really what we're looking for here. I think you'll find it. More developments will come in in the future with um, green options like green roofs and things like that, that they're trying to meet sustainability and energy needs and those things actually help them. And so instead of getting a black roof, they'll get a green roof potentially, you know, which will cool off that whole area. But you'll, you'll start to find more of that. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Maintaining and respecting neighborhoods. Uh, it is essential that new developers research which uh, Sarah has brought up, and afterwards have consideration for the neighborhood in which 
It will be established when making design, usage, parking, height, mass, and other decisions. And I think uh, in the case of Tregor, he was uh, quite careful in courting us and in meeting with us and presenting information. And I, I am hopeful that going forward, any new development does the same thing with its mothers. Um, and applying uniform guidelines uniformly. Uh, yes, we're in a smart growth district where we are on Green, Gould, and Ash. However, what guidelines there are really should be uniform across the town. No, I don't think so. You don't think so? No, I, mean, I think Green Street has special consideration. I, if you look at the maps that we've worked on, by the way, or that I started to work on, um, I think that you apply them fairly, but you need to consider, I mean, you're just asking us to consider the parking requirements in a specific neighborhood, right? So let's say we decided that, um, I mean, the bottom of Haven Street is certainly different than the top of Gould Street, mm -hmm. right? We got you know four lanes of, of traffic practically down yeah. that end, and there's parking on the sides. I wouldn't treat that the same as I would top of Gold Street. I mean, I understood the whole the whole point of this exercise was to address the need for specific design guidelines in areas that that abut the downtown Smart Growth District and where that abutment of the downtown smart growth district abuts residential neighborhoods. So it's, it's a long, whatever the perimeter is <coughs> where the downtown smart growth district abuts residential neighborhoods. And frankly, all of them where, where they are, are historic either with the, the capital H or the small H. So I mean, I, 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 mean, I understand the point, and I mean, I, all points are, are valuable here, but I mean, my understanding was that we were specifically targeting uh, the areas where the, this, this district, the zoning district, this overlay district, abutted residential neighborhoods. And to that extent, I think it should be uniformly applied to that. Um, so I, I think that's not correct me if I'm wrong. No, no, well, sort of. no. You, you, I think you lost folks when you said, and it should be uniformly yeah. applied to that. So oh, when right, I say uniformly applied, it's being considerate. What the consideration should be given. I, I'm not saying that that each of those neighborhoods should be treated the same. They should be they should be treated with the same overarching guidelines, but specific to that particular residential neighborhood. Okay. I think what we were, we were talking about doing was uh, was developing a list of things we see in specific areas, right? Seeing how generalized some of those could be, and some of them might be very specific. So you say, um, you know, you say you want a 15 foot setback from any residential property, right? If we find that that's valid throughout, maybe that gets applied as a general rule, but it might yeah. just only be possible in certain areas. And so then you say, when it can't be 15 feet, uh, you have to address it using a landscape buffer or something. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, there might be some that are very specific. Uh, we talked about, originally I was saying, okay, well, from here to here on Green Street, it's gonna be this, and we keep saying Green Street, but it, there are certainly more neighbors than that. From here to here on Green Street, it might be this. If we can say that in general terms and it can apply to many locations, it might just say when there's a residence or, that's what we're trying to get to right now. Okay. I'm not sure I, I or, or, or we, and we all we have different um, constituencies here, I suppose, although they clearly overlap. Um, <coughs> From the standpoint of the, the historical commission, I mean, I, some of them I think should should apply uniformly. Like for example, you just mentioned that 15 foot setback. Uh, I mean, it's in the it's in the guidelines that there's a 15 foot setback everywhere that it abuts the residential neighborhood. Am I wrong? I think it says residence neighborhood. Residence, residence district. district. Sorry. District. Yeah, that's oh, right. the key. That's well, well, yeah. But I guess what the issue is term dwelling to me. Right, and that's something we need to look at in right. more detail. Yeah, and I, and I I totally agree. I mean, it, it's not. It, it doesn't depend on the district. It depends on on the nature of the of the existing or historical with a small H or large H community. In any event, I mean, you just we all have different opinions, I guess. But but I guess. I think all I'm saying, and I believe all the alliance would agree, is that where it abuts residential neighborhoods, a 15-foot setback should, at a minimum, I would say, should should be honored. And, and we would say, the historical commissions would say, regardless of what was there before, uh, and I'm not trying to relive uh, the Gould Street situation, um, but, but if we, going forward, 
um, we would we would prefer that it say to to the next applicant, notwithstanding the fact that your structure previously was two feet from the residential neighborhood, whatever you're planning on developing, our guidelines are going to require that it be 15 foot uh, for what it's worth. And, and I didn't mean to, I mean, we should probably do this in order. And let's, I guess, say we can, because um, then I would like to have about five minutes after that. I thought, well, you, you've gotten through. You almost, did you finish? That's it? Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. So make, yeah. One of my thoughts about the design guidelines was how we have all these different projects that are coming in all in that one area. and. I guess I was wondering, what are you, how, is anybody thinking about, like, we should all have this type of street land, or we should all have quick sidewalk, or we should all, you know, just something that's a cohesive something, so it doesn't look like, oh, you, you know, this style, that style, this needs to be something that, that binds it all together, so that it's, it's a community, you know, it's all a lot of community, you know, it's not just this isolated area. We don't want everything to look the same, and, and certainly the street is owned by the town, and the sidewalks are owned by the town. And the standards you see in the, in the downtown were done by the town. The brick sidewalks and the lamps and stuff like that. That's not on the developer typically. So who is that? Well, that's the town. If you want to chip in some money, <laughs> we can do it. There was state funding as well for that. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Remember yeah. when there's state funding, uh, there's still a lot of town funding. Right. Yeah. Goes with that. Yeah. The percentage Remember that was in small. April. <laughs> April third. Yeah. yeah. Um, may I? Sure. D just a couple of um of of comments from from our perspective um for your consideration. And again, um, my understanding, our understanding was that the the exercise was to develop specific guidelines for where this downtown smart growth district abutted residential neighborhoods. And, and that's, that's all we're, we're addressing. Um, and with respect to that, um, that this was excellent. And, and we concur with a, with a lot of those in terms of specificity, or with several of those. Like, for example, a 15-foot um, setback. We agreed that there should be specific height limitations. Um, those sounded great. We talked about it being no higher than 10 feet above the ridge line, but I like, I like Pam's better. Um, but here's what I'd like to say about it. Um, I, I, I went through the, your design guidelines. I went through uh, the zoning bylaw. I went through uh, DHCD's um, design standards for 40R districts. Um, and at the time, we were thinking about developing sub-district guidelines. I know we're not now, but I still understand that you're talking about incorporating some specific written guidelines that would address the situation somehow. So to that end, um, what I found, and I think um, I do speak for the Historical Commission when I say this, but I also am saying this um, on my own. Um, I found uh, some interesting and, and important support in those DHCD guidelines for concepts that I think should be incorporated into your into your written guidelines. Um, and I'm just going to sort of paraphrase them, um, and you'll get the idea really quickly where I'm headed. Um, and again, it's it's in areas that directly abut um, residential neighborhoods. Okay, time out. Uh, I'm sorry. I've, go ahead. The there is no such thing as a residential neighborhood. It doesn't exist. We I have disagree. residential. Fair enough. We have residential districts. We have residential properties. The residential neighborhood is not something that uh, has an has a, a identity. Well, with you know, all due respect, Dave, that's your opinion, and I don't agree. I think that Green Street area, that Gould Street area, is a residential. It is a collection of residential properties. So, so you call I think it whatever you want, David. I call I, it a residential if, neighborhood. If if it's just terminology at this point. Yeah, yeah. I, I well, think I'm the issue saying, there. I'm not saying it has a legal it has a legal standard. Well, I recognize I, it does. But I'm but I'm trying to understand if. I develop one, two, three, four, five out of seven. Is this still a residential neighborhood? When you say one, two, three, four, five, you mean of that? If, of the if I redevelop the existing properties, when does it? When is it no longer uh, a, a residential neighborhood? I, I appreciate the point. What I'm saying is, when, right now and going forward, whenever you get a proposal for a project, and that proposal abuts what is currently a residential property. Call it what you want. Properties. 
If you want, we can, we can sit around another night and define each of these areas that border the downtown smart growth district and, and we can then reach perhaps some agreement that whether you call them neighborhoods or not, residential properties, Woodward Street, Green Street, Pool Street. Can we get back Street. to your point? When, when this abuts a residential well, property? When it abuts those areas, however you call them, the, the DHCD guide, guidelines talk about your ability to include concepts of ensuring that the physical character of the development, the proposed development, is complementary to the nearby buildings. I, I think that's an important concept. It, it also talks about providing for, it's the same idea, compatible buildings that are complementary to nearby buildings. It talks about a correspondence, and I don't mean written correspondence, I mean a relationship of massing, scale, and proximity between buildings. The, the proposed building and the buildings that exist there. It also talks in, in other portions about some portions of a district, a downtown smart road district, might be appropriate for taller and or wider buildings than others. And I think you can incorporate that concept into areas that are by have done that. These, these neighborhoods. When I wrote, when I wrote the, our guidelines, I spent nights working on them. I used the DHCD guidelines and they actually referenced our guidelines as a good example of guidelines. So we've already done this sort of scaling element. We need to get a little more refined on some of the special neighborhoods. Okay, okay, I appreciate that. Um, I'm going further, it also talks about limiting architectural styles and it allows for building exterior appearance, appearance to incorporate basic design principles from a desired architectural style. I don't know whether your guidelines do that, but I, I think that is another concept that could be incorporated. And lastly, I would say, importantly, I saw in here in, in the DHD, um, DHCD guidelines uh, the statement that 40R standards and plans should avoid situations where two different land uses or densities are located next to each other. And then it goes on to say, and obviously I know it can't be helped, but then goes on to say again the same idea that I'm discussing, ensure that both are relatively compatible in terms of scale and access requirements. And I know that's really broad in general, but all I'm saying is if those principles are somehow incorporated into the specific design guidelines, you all, in your wisdom and after a consensus that's developed in the discussion, could apply those standards to specific projects and not to, not to necessarily focus on, on the Gould Street project because I, I do think it, it did come out nicely, but for in the backside where it abuts uh, the Green Street area. Um, I think if those concepts were specifically or more specifically or directly stated in these, in these design guidelines, you would have the ability to have more control um, over what actually the, the, the design looks like. And I would submit then, then arguably you would have the ability to argue that the back of, for example, the Green Street project could look significantly different than it does now. Um, based upon that, and maybe not, because different people will disagree, but all I'm saying is back to your point, John. If, if that was specifically and clearly enunciated in the design guidelines, I think you would have at least the legal capacity to reject a proposal based upon the failure of that, of that applicant to, to, to honor that specific request. That's all I'm saying. And I'd be happy. I mean, I, if you're, if the ultimate goal here is to incorporate, incorporate specific written um, statements about this into into an area of your guidelines, I, I would love Julie to, to see that as it as it develops, um, or Andrew, I'd love to see that as it develops. And I'd be happy, as I'm sure Pam and, and others would be happy, to, to to just throw some ideas out for you as well. well we're not going to be building Victorian villages. No. I'm, I'm not suggesting that. And I've said all I'm suggesting is that there all be the buildings to allow you to yeah no to conform I mean, it to what I think we have that I think like. I think what we need to work on is scale and um, densities and movements you know vehicles and people I think that's what we need to work on specifically. Um, there are much better architects out there than me, and I am not going to design every single building. And I, I like, you know, you put 10 architects in a room, you'll get 10 different designs, and that's what we want. Only 10? I think. <laughs> <laughs> those are the ones I'll show you. <laughs> they pile behind them. Just one last comment. I completely agree, Nick, and I understand the problem. I guess all I'm saying is, in my experience, when I was on the CPDC and from years of seeing other people labor through this on the CPDC, as often as not, 
the, the members of the board invariably say exactly the same thing. That we don't we don't have the, the, the wherewithal within within the statute or the bylaw or the guidelines to to try to limit or constrain or restrict a particular project's design in the way that you hear people here uh, saying they, they want it done. And I guess all, all I'm advocating for is incorporate some capacity where you have that latitude so that, so that you're not put in the position of saying, we, we can't, we can't. No, no, I, I think we do. And I think you've seen that in the last few projects that have come through. I've voiced my opinion about whether a design element was right or wrong, and they've, they've worked on it. I think the Gold Street one is, um, I think they did. I mean, yeah, they came, I think we all agree. Yeah. I think they came back with something that reflected more what the neighborhood wanted than what the architect wanted. I think that's a credit on his part, because he had a really good design initially, Agreed. too. Agreed. Um, so I, I think we do voice our opinion. Yeah, and I do think in 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 downtown smart growth that 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 is is working. What you will hear is in developments that are not using the smart growth guidelines um, that we have less of that ability, and that's right. that is in nature of 40A in, in right. the state. Um, um, also, I'll bet, you, I'll bet you if we right. did what DC, DHCD says to do in there, that they'd reject the, they'd reject our applic our. Uh, <laughs> and even worse, you have more forty proposals. <laughs> They're talking about uh, two different we agree, densities we agree. And, and stuff uh, where they're saying. Um, Complementary architecture. I'll bet you if we rejected something based on the architecture, the HCD would shoot it, shoot our rejection down. Mm -hmm. Guarantee. Even though I, I highlighted numerous places. Guarantee. They, they, don't, they don't even read what they wrote. Yeah. 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 Define what that means. Give yeah. me a give They'll me a come in and they'll say, no, you can't tell them to do yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. How many of them have practical experience None of them dealing with any of this? Ridiculous. Yeah, but, exactly. I mean, by the, by the same token, the, um, I try to be aware that our goal is not to prevent change. It's redeveloping something is more, most often a good thing. Uh, even if, if you're rebuilding a house, it's, you're going to have a, a, a better house, newer construction, newer, uh, newer materials, newer uh, equipment, whatever you want to call it. So the, we have to be real careful with guidelines that prevent economic redevelopment. Does it make, make the redevelopment uneconomic? Because then what you end up with is somebody just tearing it down, building up exactly the same thing. Or you have a town that people don't invest in. Right. 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 I mean, that's that's the matter. Is it right? You drive through a town and no one's rebuilt anything. It all looks from like it's from the seventies. It looks run down, and it looks like it's yeah. not invested in. Right. So there's a balance but, here. But yeah, there's, there's definitely a balance, a balance yeah. You know, there's economic development, I, and there's, you know, character and identity. Right, and, right. And I, I yeah. think we can have both of them. I, I yeah, one truly of the, one do. Of the, one of, just going back a little bit to the parking issue, one of the things that has been happening a lot in commercial areas, which is, is annoying to me at best, is allocating parking spaces for large yeah. numbers of, of handicapped spaces that are never used, or spaces reserved for XYZ function that are never used. The, the square feet of pavement is a substantial asset. Costs a lot of money, wants to be used. So at some point, we're going to have to deal with the um, occupancy per percentages, whatever you want to call it. Because we, in in the areas that we're that we're trying to, to work on, we can't afford unused space or unusable space, and you know even sometimes a bloody traffic interchange, the intersection itself is precious square feet, and if they mistime the lights, and you're sitting there waiting for nothing to happen, this is very annoying. Yeah, so, so at some point, we, it's a, I don't think we know how to, to uh, tackle the, the problem, but we should be aware of it. Fair enough. Um, Pam, thank you for putting these together. I think that the guidelines can address most of these concerns. I'll call them concerns, right? So we don't have to be... They are. The only they're one, not written to be very stringent. They're, they're 
meant to be mindful. Have sure. You considered this. The only one I would object to outright right now is the height one because, for example, if you said you could build something 15% taller than, I don't want to be right. I don't want to talk badly. There's two houses there that are three stories high that are probably well over the 33 feet that we allow. Mm -hmm. Right? 33 feet is our max. That's the regular house. You could build, you know, 50 feet. That doesn't seem right. Also, so what happens if those small little cottages that are left at the end, that, that owner wants to expand those, they're allowed to. Yeah, it's another so now that right. starts to, and that's my question that I had for Historic originally was, do you limit what somebody who owns that house can do to that because it's historic with a low H? You know, with a the low the only, H? And we, we talked about that, and absolutely not. And sadly, the Historical Commission can't even limit uh, alterations or, or renovations of any kind. It's only demolition. And right. The only way to get at what you're talking about is to have a local historic district. So what you do is, if you look at the picture that you showed us that um, of the of looking up Green Street, where you can see the little cottage houses, I mean, almost looks like a beach, you know, community, right? Yeah. yeah. If our guidelines repeat that rhythm, which I think they do, but probably on a larger scale because we're doing with larger buildings. Now we look at this street, we make them smaller. That rhythm of solid void, solid void, solid void, and that sort of lower face, let's say the projecting bays have a lower height, you can repeat that feel. And I think that's probably the best we can do there. You know, So if someone buys or someone has two or three lots worth, and they do this sort of, you know, solid void, solid void. It'll still feel like that smaller village, even though maybe what happens behind it comes up a little or is denser. Mm. That's the kind of things I'm starting to think about. Right, I, but I, I'm thinking back across the months of all the discussions, and I think the one sticking point that we had consistently was the height of the Gould Street property in comparison to the dwellings. Of it. Yeah, and but they did step that back quite a bit up the top. He did, he right? did. Yeah. and that, that is a, success, a very successful yeah. application. I also think you'll be surprised by how much void space there is in the courtyard, how much empty We're there is. I wanted to mention that also about the the idea of the step back. That, that it was one of the things that we <coughs> talked about that I neglected to mention. That, however, you guys characterize or define the issue of height, um, also incorporate that step back as those. As yeah, those I think that's always going to be in play. Yeah, and and. You, you guys did, and, and the developer did, did do that on that property, and they also did it on the Postmark property, very effectively. Has anybody seen that project on North Avenue, big, like, six-story? I'm assuming it's 40R. North it's Avenue? It's just train station Wakefield. Mm -hmm. It's not 40R. Oh, yeah. They don't have 40R. Okay. Well, in any event, you know what I'm talking about as you're going towards yeah. the next okay. building? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, I stopped, and... Uh, the, the houses that are on the street that oppose it are in shadow all day long. It's so sad. That's know? a huge. Might have been a 40B. That might be 40B, and I wanted yeah, to say yeah. it was Weiner. But I don't think it WS, is. But it's not right. I, I think it is WS. Do you think it's WS, yeah. right? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Tony Cotterano's opening a restaurant in there. Tony. Well, that's why it's got that huge 15-foot yeah. podium. It's got a huge first floor to accommodate commercial, like yeah. heavy yes. commercial. There's a major yeah. restaurant that going in there. automatically brings you up an extra yeah. five feet. Yeah. And I did say this before, and I just want to repeat it. We, we are all <laughs> cognizant of the fact that if we all or you all make it too difficult uh, or too cumbersome to develop 40 R's, we're going to see a hell of a lot more 40 B's that are a hell of a lot worse. So, I mean, it's definitely uh, a balancing, and I think everybody recognizes that. But yeah, I think if you want to look at a building, you know, uh, Main Street in Stoneham, right, the next to the the donut shop across from the. Uh, well, right when you, uh, well, before Felicia's yeah. from our side, yeah. right? There are several tall buildings, sort of in the MF Charles flavor, mm -hmm. and they just put right. up a new one, right? Really nice. It's brick and stone base, mm -hmm. right? They didn't step that top story. And it's just really imposing. And they did that all the way down the street. All yeah. three of the new major buildings, they don't step back that top story. Mm -hmm. And so you get four stories of flat phase. Even as nice as the building they made it, it's just really imposing. Just doing that thing would have broken that up so mm -hmm. quite a bit. That's a good example to go look at I and mean, compare it to our guidelines, which would have broken that face up more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did that three times. 
Mm. Well, I mean, the other just, thing. Just to say, is I don't think anybody in the neighborhood is is saying we don't want to we don't want change. It's not that we don't want change. No. Everybody likes change. Everybody likes improvement. We just want it all to fit together. You know, we want everything to be integrated and to you know still feel like a community. I, I that's my word is community, and then, and it feels like. We're going to have a loss of community, and we're hoping that we can somehow work something in to still be able to be so there is community. It's really, really, really important. You know, we have kids that live as children on Green Street, you know, and we're afraid of, you know, you know how, how is it all going to change? Cars busy by, can we walk in? Can, I don't know. It's just because there's, there's a shift. The first shift was moving the Atlantic Supermarket. It's, be able to walk over there the grocery shopping. I don't know, just the whole area like feels a little tenuous. So it's not that we don't want change. We just want to have it be good change. Okay. Thanks for that. Do we want to talk about some other things specifically or get back to Tony's? Two things that I struggle with in you know just from conceptually as we turn to some of these, right? I, um, I think that the the three um, sort of big pieces that I, I think we're going to have to um, work through is height setbacks and and parking or a, uh, access, right? That's really the three big things that I see. And and um, you know whether we call it a, a residential structure, a neighborhood, a district, or whatever, but um, but what we do know is that in general we're not talking about a district. We're talking about some other property. Um, that happens to have a residential building on it today, or um, or ten years from now when this develop this um, development goes in on this parcel. The thing that I'm struggling with is is how do we how do you restrict the use of someone's property based on what their neighbor does? <laughs> you know, so um, you know if. It, let's say right there's a house on Green Street that went up to that went that put it so suddenly because that neighbor put up a second story that if we have something based on 15% or there you know, now suddenly their neighbor is allowed to then go up that at least that high or whatever we whatever we 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 say so you know that's the thing that I'm struggling with is as your neighbor changes it's okay for your it, the value of your property goes up maybe or the the, the development potential of your but property goes up because you're de you, I don't know, you you know where I'm going sort of this this changeable um, um, development uh, based on what your neighbor is doing so that's what I'm struggling with is how do we define what that residential neighborhood is because I think that's really what we what we want um, and it almost doesn't matter what happens within that neighborhood that you have the, the properties along there or adjacent to there have a certain set of rights um, or I, I should uh, yeah, I'll use the rights, a certain set of rights under this set of design guidelines. That's what I'm, that's sort of, that you sort of jump into the next piece, but as we talk about that, how I'm, what I'm struggling with, because it, context is important, um, but context changes from, you know, you just said the context 10 years ago was different than it is today and what might have been okay 10 years or not okay 10 years ago maybe fits better today. And some of this may change quicker than, uh, you know, other pieces, other pieces may never change at all, ever. How long did it take Martha Greenwood to convert it from grass to the neighborhood? <laughs> Do we do we know? No, no. We do we know the span of years that it very took? Very short. It was very short. Um, mm. It was something like four years or four or five wow. years. Wow. Yeah. What, pretty um, significant. Yeah. Was that? It's pretty it was long. Yeah. 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 So, I think it was yeah, like 1870. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 The map was 1866. <laughs> and that's so. That's the other odd thing there <laughs> is is that look at his maps, yeah. is that if I have my um, if I can think about this right, so there was right. There's that nice picture there of all the the, the houses right in a row. But if you step back from there, 
what did you have surrounding that neighborhood? You had the black block, you had those tenement buildings which were which were pretty high. You I mean so you it I guess it was never it was never uh, that off into the distance. You never had you the the neighborhood. I think always had something. I'm going to say looming over it um, until only real recently did, did did it not have something higher, sort of um, looking overhead. It's only been in the past probably well, 50 years. It was what faced the, the, the train station was the high looming buildings, but upgrade and oh, oh yeah, but the Blackburn building went. Um, went just about up to almost the, 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 the Google Street development almost. I mean, it took over, it was four blocks. It didn't well, go four up to parcels. That, whatever that sits, Simes Corner or whatever, it didn't mm. go that far. It was all the way past the uh, uh, CVS parking lot. Yeah, so CVS, CVS, whatever right. it is, right? right. right. Yeah. Walgreens, whatever. It is. So yeah. I'm not yeah. saying I, uh, I'm not saying that the the idea. <laughs> I, what I'm getting at is that you know the context changes, and even as you pick you know one little piece of history, that that. Um, that even changed probably, I, you know, I don't know what the years, how the years, you know, de how many decades it had these different buildings in here, but that whole area was always, has, has always been changing. Downtown Reading has always been sort of these, having these, these changes um, well, and sort of picking the, I mean, I don't think we want to pick one and say, oh, well, during this year, this decade, this is how we want to remember it. I, I don't know. Right. I just yeah, it's a dilemma. I mean, it is. It, 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 you're right. It's a conundrum, and I, I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that is either. I mean, the same thing can be said. I mean, you go back far enough, and I mean, before zoning, and my neighborhood, your neighborhood, didn't look the same. Right. You know, right. So yeah. Everything Absolutely. All yeah. Changed. Yes. Yeah. Andrew developed some maps. Um, do you want to tell us what these are and yeah. what they represent? Sure. Um, so the two up there are just general base maps that we've with Rachel that might have asked that she would like to mark them up in such um, any discussions we have. Um, but what we have here, I'm just going to zoom out a little more so you can see it a little bit. Um, it's a chloroplast based on building elevations. So the lighter colors mm -hmm. are a lower elevation, where darker is a higher elevation. Yeah, is this the top of is or a grade? Is this base or Absolute elevation. Yeah, elevation. Yep. Right. Where did we get that from JS? Yep. Okay. And I didn't have numbers based on actual building height, which is why we had to go on elevation. That's fine. That's good. Um, Wrong too. But you can see it. We get. Um, higher to low as we get north to south, and I, you can see other things. The pink outlines are historic. We have bus roads through here in the train depot. Mm -hmm. um, we have open space, which I don't think there is a lot of open space around our downtown, um, but it could help to enhance walkability. Open space, I know, has been discussed before here. Um, what, what's the cross hack on that? I know. Oh, sorry, I mean, um, that's a 100-foot buffer that extends into okay. the residential zone. I just wanted to put that in to Thank show. Um, so that's not in the district, that's just the right. 100 feet from got the it, district. Got it. Okay. Yeah. You can see the impact. Um, and as we move down, I just highlighted more of the areas that we kind of discussed last time. You can see Green Street here in Washington, and then up above Gold. Um, and as we go down, we'll just zoom in further. Um, here we had um, contour lines as well to try to give an idea of what building heights might actually be. You can see their elevations. First, the contour 106 to 136. So gives you an idea of what the building height might be around. Um, and same thing as we go down to Golden Haven. And it gives you an idea of what historic parcels are around the given areas and whatnot. Um, so I was just trying to get more of an idea of what else we can do with stuff like this. I've been looking into 3D um, mapping and whatnot. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot that I'd have to learn with that, but it certainly could be a possibility. Um, we can talk about but that. Yeah, just really wanted to show elevations because it was brought up before and heights do seem to be a big right. concern. So. This point David brought up and actually mirrors what Pam had said about if, if something's on a lower parcel having its height relative. Yeah. Right. David, you brought that up last time about yeah. talking about what that grade is doing 
just understand what the building height could be. Yeah. Again, we're sort of on this side of Main Street, but there's the other side of Main Street as well. Mm -hmm. and so I guess I was looking for feedback about what else could potentially be done with programs like this and what we can try mm -hmm. to highlight more of less. Um, there's other types of data that you guys want us to try to mm -hmm. display or analyze. Um, yeah. We could do a solid void exercise, you know, just looking at that. If you made everything black or white, right there, right? So that, that's like a <coughs> part T map, which shows you where the buildings are versus where there aren't buildings or there isn't structure. You don't understand height from that, but you understand that solid void issue. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe patterns play into what the design guidelines look like right. as far as scale. So um, on, on that map that you have up there mm -hmm. right now, I think that, you know, um, as we are talking about how the buildings within the district um, react with the buildings just outside of the district, right, it would also be good to understand what that next, what that row what the height is of those buildings right outside the district you know the the couple of things that that jump out at to, to me at this and it's you know it's um it's no surprise really um you know that the that the the height issues really are um even if we you know with a 45 foot high building um on some of these parcels really because of the nature of the topography really are pr I'm going to say pretty limited I mean we're really talking about the southern half of the um, of the um, area and um, and even that not not so much one side because right we've got the train tracks there and I mean so so you know they're really as we start to think through what is that play on heights between um, within the district and the properties that are residential today um, the, I think the number of I, th I think we're talking really talking about a small number of um, of areas that we need to focus on we need to either verify some of this info or think about what the perception of height is because you're telling me that the building that Christopher's is in is taller than the MF Charles building and that the Reading Cooperative Bank is taller than the MF Charles building in absolute, yeah. Absolute to some point. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so that's weird, though. I don't perceive it that way. Does anyone perceive that when you walk down Haven Street that the Reading Cooperative right, Bank right. is taller than MF Charles? I'm going to take a look at it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The MF Charles tomorrow. is the taller. That's, that was our landmark. When we came up yeah. with a height, we were like, okay, yeah. this building is the tallest thing we're ever going to have. Well, except that it went to Washington Arms across, across, across the street. Across the street, and we yeah. didn't consider yeah. it because the front porch sort of breaks up that first. Yeah. Yeah. Mass. But it also, I mean, I, I understand that it's a, a, a graphics super challenge would be to have the same information, including postmark, the Gold Street, and I mean, the things that we have just yeah. recently mm -hmm. approved. That, that yeah, I was thinking yeah. the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Let's put those in. Those, those heights. Those, yeah. yeah, that's no problem. Yeah, color those blocks like they're already done. Yeah. Um, if they yeah. fall yeah. out. And there's, there's also the uh, the big multifamily building that burned out. Is, Sam is that high school? Middle school, school building? Yeah, middle school. Yeah. School oh, middle school. Yeah, yeah. talk about school something house. that looms. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Yeah. That's such a green <laughs> building. <laughs> I mean, it's a great building. It's a great building, but yeah, I was walking by there the other day, and you know, you do. I mean, we're all so used to it, yeah. and it is set yeah. back so that it's. Yeah, but it, it is so much higher yeah. um, than when you're down on. Uh, on, on uh, Actually, is that building ca captured in this map? Is that the, uh, the, the, uh, the white square with the uh, red outline? It's, it's actually right behind top. One of your other maps zooms out. Does it now? No. Right now it's, uh, it's left. But yeah, we can. It's over. Yeah. Yeah, we can. Okay. We well, can that get was, some of the buildings around, like Washington Arms, yeah. and just give a sense of yeah. those heights as well. 
Yeah, we actually, I don't know if you remember, but back in 2009, we actually used that in the PowerPoint that we went to town meeting with and put the heights on there. Yeah. yeah. So we right. have that. Yeah. Building has some space around it as well, though, so it's not sort of right on top of mm. something, although it's definitely casting a shadow, you know, um, north of it. It does. It does. Yeah. 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 It sort of lends some grandeur to it. You know, it's, you look at it and you you see a new use for it, um, and you remember its history. I guess. I don't think we'd ever want to see that kind of building torn down. We certainly wouldn't want to copy it either, though. I don't think we'd ever want to copy that. Right? I mean, just to, to John's point about. Um, I mean, I, I, I do see that you're talking about mostly focusing on the, on the southern side of, of this district, but I do think you at least need to be thinking about the eastern side and the northern side. I mean, obviously, the, the, my yeah, lifetime yeah. is the southern side, but yeah. in other people's lifetime, mm -hmm. there's, there's the development, there's the potential to develop, you know, along the Woodman Street area and um, on, the, on the eastern side of... Mm -hmm. Of the main flows already developing, you know, those are yeah. those are residential neighbors too. So you at least need to think about that. Yeah. Well, the Wolverine Street territory is the one which is populated by uh, properties that are on the national registry. There's like the 11, homes. Yeah, there's yeah. like eleven properties in there. Uh, we talked it when we when we were discussing with the board of selectmen expanding the DSGD. I mean, one of the considerations was should we push it further, uh, further in that direction? Well, on the and south side of Woburn Street. Yeah, and it's wide. Why? I was right. against it because I didn't think you could ever address it. Right. You can yeah. never address that. You know, what are you going to do? Build historic homes? If this doesn't make any sense, no one's going to want to do that. Right. So yeah, they're also. What could yeah. you possibly put yeah. there? I mean, luckily, there's also a, a terrain break. The uh, Wilburn Street is actually some number of uh, a substantial number of feet higher than the parking lot behind the right. yeah. Atlantic. Okay. So next steps. We've got this information, and I think we, we need to start coming up with some numbers, if you will, something concrete mm -hmm. to start looking at. We could do it independently and then compare notes. I need to have more than one set of notes. <laughs> That's true. I give you maps. Um. Yeah, I've I've have um, I've run dry on <laughs> the detail level of this. I took none, some number of passes at it, and I don't trust anything that I've come up with. <laughs> well, I like the feedback I got last time on my maps, mostly because it contradicted what I put down there, which was good. <laughs> you know, where I thought there shouldn't be any commercial, uh, Robin was adamant that, you know, it's a great pedestrian pathway, and so um, that's something to look at. Um, I, I think that, again, so I focus sort of on the, uh, the apartments down there on, you know, on Washington and High and, and on Green Street, because I think those are, um, those represent sort of two very different types of parcels. What they have on there now, what they, how they might fall because they're larger, like the, the apartment building area, mm -hmm. and the capacity it would have to do more than what's on Green Street, you know, which is very small parcels and unlikely to, to be developed bigger. So my plan was to start using those to look at what the design guidelines should, the, the numbers for those neighborhoods, or the numbers for that type of neighborhood. Right, so um, what the numbers should look like for the language anyways it might not be a number it might just say um, must be buffered you know and then you know and then we could just say what kind of buffers it might have and not be very specific and then deal with it specifically it um, might not be a bad idea to start with like parcels that maybe and I don't really want to say this because I mean, it's not on the market but more more, more likely to be redeveloped 
-hmm. and then figure out kind of what you would want there. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a starting there's point. We have to do that in the application of DHCD. Yeah. What's that? One of the maps that we submitted back in 2009 on the first iteration of Smart Growth was um, properties likely to be redeveloped. So we have that, mm -hmm. at okay. least in the, the okay. more And how, how, like, how uh, <laughs> yeah. close was it? How <laughs> long time ago? <laughs> Do we not have to do that this time as well? Oh, uh, we must With the expansion, yeah, I think must. we did. Yeah. But we had some in mind, because we knew yeah. there was some well, on the like market. The post know? office was nowhere near being in, under consideration so no back in 2009. Cool. No. Well, those were on this right. new go-around. The new go-around. That's true, too. Yeah. But 2009, it was a guess. Yeah. But 2009 also only. That's bank. Did you did you do it for the whole area or just no. for what ended up? No, just well. No, I thought no, we did I, it before yeah. we yeah. came yeah. up with the actual yeah. limits. They were we were it all was the, the way whole up thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. That, yeah. that might okay. be a, yeah. Right. That we'll might be the case. I don't remember. It would be interesting to see like what's yeah happened in ten yeah. years. It probably had no yeah. basis other than somebody looking at a lot and saying, "Oh, yeah. 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 yeah." Well, financial basis. Let, let me just th throw out something that I, I forgot to bring up earlier. Um, one of the possibilities that we could consider um, design guidelines that would heavily favor, if not um, require, multifamily as opposed to mixed use. Well, but that's because what I put on my map for like Green Street. I didn't think there'd be any mixed use there. Right. But this, I'm not sure if we have to accommodate the. No, because our guidelines say if it's residential only, then these are the limits. That's what Chapin Street came in at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Residential yeah. only, there are different limits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we've got. But the setbacks and, and stepbacks and stuff are the same, depending, regardless of whether it's an excuse or not. Yeah, and we need to look at that to mm -hmm. make sure that. Yeah, because maybe yeah. that's not. Right. Yeah, because one, one of the parcels that may come into play is, is one or the other of the current right aids because of the corporate takeover involved there. Well, what I was thinking was that if you start to think about what happens, you know, sort of the, the play on the Washington Street um, and, mm -hmm. and how that neighborhood, how that parcel area. or parcel yeah. areas interact with the residential um, abutters, um, sort of the, the the flip would be to, to okay how does taking those same things how does that play on that r that right aid um, site and mm. does it match with those two does the same guidelines match on those two sites right. because I think right it's the same there's some of the same issues at play there I think my notes were basically that there's a buffer on the back side on the residential side and then the the front is Haven Street, you know. So I think it's a matter of access. Access from the front side and, well, I don't know that we'd have a drive through lot like that. That right aid, just for the record, I mean, that, that is in, in our historical inventory. The actual building? Yeah. And, and I, for one, would, our commission, I'm sure, would hate to see that go for what it's worth. Should I'd pick like some. To see a there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> different strokes. For different See, I want the park on the corner. I want the park on the triangle piece that three-story okay. mansard building across from mm -hmm. Gould. John, what was you know where the Gould where Gould and kind of Haven mystic. split? Yes. Whatever That's where I want to park. Whatever he thinks that along that, that that area. Hey, we'll take down that mound. Who's he? Yeah. Okay. It'd be perfect. We'll have a little cemetery. And how that is what the residents are raising. That needs to then be displayed to a site like the, mm -hmm. the Rite Aid building. Mm -hmm. because Try well, the cemeteries used, used to be the place to go. They used to be the social haven place, right? People would North go there and have picnics and stuff. Yeah, right. They play there. They've got to play. Right, right, right. Okay, sorry. Try them out on right Yeah, try them out on right aid. Just, just to add a little bit of detail, which you may or may not know about all of those apartment buildings, we have been noticing that they are rehabbing them, putting in granite, upgrading. So the possibility that that property that turned over around three years ago, turning over again, doesn't seem to be likely one. Like, like, no, just, I don't, I don't just think so. Just, you know. Yeah, I think you're right there, especially if they're investing in it now, because it's a sort of a cheap exactly. investment to raise the rent, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. right? It is. Yeah. 
and it's it's as somebody who and people don't move out all that often. Mm. Right. As they move out, that's when they up the rent yeah. and, yeah. and, and rehab. But that is what's happening. And I think and I mentioned this the last time I was here. Uh, what we're seeing with the four properties that have turned over is improvements in the properties as right. dwellings. Each one of them. Mm -hmm. The, the yeah. little blue house that is now beautiful big. big structure and beautifully designed. That one, I think it's Paul Murphy's house. Red did that one. Uh, the one next to Donna's that just turned over. Redid all the floors. They're redoing all the floors on Pat Street property and improving that. So that's what we're seeing mm -hmm. is improvements and continued use as well. But just just throwing it yeah. out there is, is this is the reality right now. Okay. Again, I said if somebody wants to offer me three million dollars, you can <laughs> <laughs> okay. I say that very lightly. Yeah. <laughs> you say that lightly now. <laughs> okay. Um, so you think we're going to look at the CVS lot because it actually right. has all the conditions right, yeah. we're thinking about, right? I'm sorry. The right. Well, if it's historic, then it's the CVS lot. <laughs> <laughs> Just think of it as What's, the what year RLD is that? That's a, a 60s building? Pardon? Is that a 60s building or a 50s building? I think it's 50s building. Maybe be 40s. I'm not sure off the top of my head. I thought it was 30s because of the Art Deco it style. It might be 30s, yeah. I mean, it's it hmm. certainly doesn't feel that way because they've... Yeah, I know. Ruined. It's totally yeah. different. Yeah. When it was the light department, stuff. you had it had a much better feel. Yeah. But nonetheless, it is. But it see, is. now that that building, if we really felt that there was value in the skin of that building, it's low enough and easy enough for somebody to leave it in place and sort of build into it. Right. Incorporate it. Right. You know, so that's that's an easy structure to work with. As opposed to the Gould Street building, which was, you know, just right. not. Mm -hmm. If it was flipped, mm -hmm. it went, you know, if it was yeah, all no. street front, I bet you they could have saved the street front if there was mm -hmm. value in it. Right. I don't really think it's that attractive a building. But yeah. 25 30. Haven, 30. RMLD Department Office, Art Deco, 1939. Okay. Just, Good just, job. And I know nothing. I'm skin your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> so now you're saying. Don't, don't ever. Uh, Jonathan, you're saying Where's that that building is on the register? Uh, I'm virtually certain well, it we is. we can tell you. Yeah. I, I didn't bring my iPad, so I can Okay, check so it. then that would that would have uh, the even. same yep. the same uh, rules on it that the post the front of the post office yes. had likely. You and gold the on the. Is that this is their list of historical well, property? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm saying um, not the national. Oh, you mean it's stepping it back, like? No. Yeah. So yeah, it doesn't you know, have an potentially argument. that's very limited to what they oh, might that's be able to do, uh, depending on what um, mass historic would accept. No, I don't. As think a setback, like they really wanted, they really pushed. Like where the the only reason mass historic is involved, in, I mean, they're involved in the look in at twenty four Gould, right? And then we'll know how they okay. uh, code it. But uh, and the only reason they're involved in Gould Street is because he's looking for financing. Where is it? Um, that that requires it says national register. Not red. So yeah. the, so the other one they're not Haven. really involved. So if it you could actually, that? if you could just. Briefly tell us at some point no. what no. the restrictions on the seat on the oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Would be. The right would and we can understand potentially so what not. that what the limits on that property are. Hmm. I can check that, but I I think the only limits is that it's, it's on our inventory. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'll have yeah. to check so that. Yeah. Yeah. Demo, but there may be a limit to covenant like there was on the post. Right. Yeah. It's system. not on the national no. register according to this um, inventory. Okay. So yeah. all it requires is uh, a hearing demo for delay. us for demolition delay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, no offense, but I don't think that's necessary. The, uh, this is a thought process of what could go there to see what the design guidelines should be. Whether that's historic building or not wouldn't impact that. Well, the way I understand it now is somebody coming in is not going to save the building. Probably Sorry, not. They're just not going to do it. So they're going to, that's fully our design guidelines on that parcel. Now. Correct. And that's, that's our thought process. Let's see mm -hmm. what our design guidelines would be for that parcel. Right. What I was trying to understand was if there were going to be rules that made them save that building, I think that right. our guidelines would be very different. I'm not for saying that, because for that parcel. Suggesting yes. It, yes. But because, because it is, in <laughs> fact, a historic building on our inventory, there's, there's at least some desire to actually save the bones of that building. And, yeah. and I, I agree if we were actually doing that building, but to me, this is a generic parcel. 
These are just parameters to look at for generic parcel no to see what your design sorry, guidelines are. Generic parcel that has specific parameters around. You want to talk generic parcel? Let's go to. Um, I don't think you were saying this is a generic parcel. You were no. saying the design guidelines should be designed around the generic, generic parcel. parcel. Correct. Yes. Yeah, I think you two were saying different, right. different yeah. things. Yeah, you're not yeah. disagreeing, yeah. Yes. Yeah. necessarily. Right. Right. Well, I agree with the next thing. That neighborhood. Whatever that might have been. <laughs> if it was national, if there were more restrictions, mm -hmm. then that wouldn't be a good site to use as a, as as a generic, generic parcel. As a generic but we could have to talk about it. Yeah. Right. 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 Okay. Any parting thoughts? So we can talk about this again on the 26th, and I think we should. Okay. Um, just to keep the momentum, yeah. we don't have a huge agenda that night. Um, so March? March 26th, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it'll be listed under other business, but it may be used as fast so if other things on the agenda don't happen. So it'll come at the beginning of the night. Seven yeah, the meeting agenda right now doesn't have much on it at all. Um, yeah. So. Are you, if you're, are you, are you going to have something in writing at that point? I mean, uh, I'm going to start working on some. I'm, I'm only suggesting if there is something. I mean, I'd love to see. Yeah. It. Well, we're not going to have a meeting before then, but I'd love to. Just I mean, I'll get it to. I'll get what I'm going to work on to Julie as fast yeah. as I can. But I mean, it's. Do you want us to try to brainstorm some stuff as well based on this uh, feedback? We if you well. guys have ideas, yeah. I welcome them. I mean, I don't want to. Right. Just no, I know. It's just we just haven't had a lot of time. I know. No yeah. one does, yeah. and that's why. Yeah. If we get little pieces from everybody, maybe it means something. Yeah. Desktop. Thank you. Sarah and Pam, thank you for what you guys yeah. brought tonight. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And John, oh, yeah, it doesn't linger on the computer. Just save somebody. Make sure you leave your wipers up. Having to retire. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the car in front of the driver. Yeah. If we're going to get clobbered yes, again. So <laughs> Thank goodness for my neighbors. <laughs> Dig me out. So then you do have some two sets of minutes. I still have yep. two Thank more. You. And then after tonight, it'll be three okay. to finish. But. Can't you do. Uh, that voice conversion thing, Dragon, what is it, Naturally Speaking? Dragon Naturally Speaking. Or you just play the recording she, of the movie back? She does awesome minutes, and okay. I just go through and edit them. Oh. It's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. She pretty much captures everything you guys say, and I just nest it a little bit. So. And speaking of someone who's watched many of these minutes on TV, there are periods of time when you can't hear anybody say That's anything. Intentional. <laughs> <laughs> Method to the madness. I think you need to start adding um, sarcasm and stuff, some font. <laughs> <laughs> Emojis. Yeah. All right, let's look at the meeting minutes for January 8th. Right. I reviewed it and I did not find any. Really Oh, I have your edits, Nick. Um, Are they not in here? Me. No, wait. They're not. I don't um, remember them, so we'll have to. So I'll them. go through and look. So Nick had a few changes. Um, on page two, third paragraph down, which starts with Mr. Diarezzo, um Halfway through, there's a he, which we're going to change to Mr. McGonagall to clarify which he we're talking about. <laughs> um, And let's see. Oh, on page four, towards the bottom of the page, um, changing pavement schedule to pavement season because that makes a lot more sense. Um, and then I left out the words H or the <coughs> acronym HVAC from the third paragraph on page six. I was glad someone was paying attention. Um, and then again on page nine, I credited the MBTA parking stickers where I should have said town parking stickers. So those are the changes from Nick for the eighth.
ready? I'm also out, Lisa. <laughs> Oh, there, there. Thank you. Have a good night. 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 Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. And you can vote. Yeah. Whether they seem correct. Okay. Move that the CBDC approve the minutes for the meeting of January 8th, 2018, as amended. Second. All in favor? Okay. January 22nd. I have edits for that too, right? Yeah, and I'll read those out as well. Read them in my voice. With my sarcasm, <laughs> and then I make don't know your so sarcasm. <laughs> your your comments come back come across angry. <laughs> like who are you talking about? <laughs> um, but I know you don't mean it. So um, on page two, let's see, one, two, three, four. fifth paragraph down, the paragraph that ends in criticized. We need to rephrase more eloquently. Um, I think Nick's point was that we can't just do away with regulations altogether and leave everything to site plan review discretion. But having some basis for people to start from is um, probably important. <laughs> yeah, we still need some protections in place and we, can, we just can't wipe it all away and then hope that everyone's developments are or that future boards have the same level of investment and uh, you know, opinions and ideas as you guys. Sure. Um, or give it a basis to deny something. Right. <laughs> um, that was my intent there. Anyways, it wasn't, it wasn't to avoid being criticized. You could say, like, so the commission has some authority. I mean, I don't mean that's not the It was, no, it was, I thought I'd written to you the, um, actually, I probably have it right here. Hold on. Well, basically, so that the commission retains appropriate authority. I mean, I don't, wrong way to put it. We need some regulations and protections for the residence districts. Can't be wide open frontier. That's what I'd written back. Yeah. To you. So that it's, it's both of those, and we need to have uh, regulatory authority, and we also need to protect those neighborhoods as best we can. Okay. So if some regulatory use. authority to protect residential neighborhoods? Yeah, or if you want to use residential neighborhoods, just say. <laughs> you know, <laughs> neighborhoods. neighborhoods is a master plan word, by the way. It's in the master plan. I get what budding properties. Dave's point there was, but, but yeah. To protect the budding properties? Yep. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, and then... On page three, um, in under the bullets, I need to add the word two before the number 24, about halfway down, um, and then change three, three below that where it says private balconies provided on rear, change it to private balconies provided on west and north sides of the building since rear is tricky um, on that lot at 14 Chicken Ave. Um, depends on what, which way you're looking at the building. Um, on page four, I actually don't know who said that. You don't think you, s so at the top, the very first paragraph where it says, um, he asked whether the visitor parking should be increased and he commented that the proposal essentially allows for three bedroom units. Are you saying you don't think you said that, Nick? No, hold on, let's see. This is what happens when you do minutes like a month later. I get to remember. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember asking if the visitor parking should be increased, especially those two spaces in the back. Yeah. But I, I know I said that it would probably be three bedroom units or could be a three bedroom unit. We could just say he commented that the proposal essentially allows for three bedroom units to take out the first part. Yeah, take out the parking right. comment. 
I didn't actually have that written down in my notes, so I don't know. Make a stuff up, you say. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Um, and then on page five, at the top, shield needs to be shielded. Um, Page six, third paragraph down, change. It says allows for a lot, change it to allows for a larger development. For a lot, given limited lot. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, that's wording. Enough. It's not great. Um, that's Those are mm -hmm. next changes. I think um, on page uh, five, the um, second to the last paragraph, last sentence, if there is a substantial amount of snow, I think it should read, it will need to be removed. Yeah, right. I don't think Dave said it will be removed. He may have, but he may have been. Right. <laughs> um, sure. It would need to be removed. But there you go. Yeah. Move that the CPDC approve the minutes for the meeting of January 22nd, 2018, as amended. Second. All in favor? Okay. Any other business we need to discuss? Is that Andrew's permanent block? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, what did you say? As we move towards getting new plaque placards with names, can't they do something modern instead of the stupid? Are we getting new placards? Well, Andrew needs one at some point. Are they, they just not getting today? today? No, if if and when they start getting new placards, it should be something more contemporary. Maybe marble to match the count. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, so I would say a nice solid maroon if background. If anyone ever asked me if you guys want new ones, I'll let you know, and then you can tell me what you want. But no one's ever asked me if you want new ones. I don't want new ones. Um, what want does mine look like? Like wood paneling from the, the my parents' basement. Yeah, it's kind of old school. <laughs> um, we have to remind everyone this is town hall. You know, they well, look in here, they see the new paint, they see the mark, but you know. Mine is, <laughs> mine is already aged. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, look at <laughs> Mine's nice and white. Yeah, yours is, warm, nice, so. yours is nice and light. Mine has no grain to it and is Why? aged. Doesn't it seem a little late to be asking for a new one? No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say mine. I said, how okay. do you get yeah. that? Right. Julie, are there any updates on the 40B on Lakeview Eaton? Um, we are going to hold the next session of the hearing in a bigger room. Um, probably it's going to be at the... Um, in the great room at the Pleasant Street Center, because the library is booked that night. But well, tuned. I asked the um, some time ago that we used. There's a large room in the top of Parker. Or the uh, library. Oh, the, like the multimedia. The yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's a that's a possibility as well. Um, yeah, because it's right now we have the great room booked. It's like on hold, but we're still trying to work it out. Mm -hmm. where it should yeah. Be. Probably it's going to end up there, at least for this next one, and then we'll see if we want to move it, perm try to move it more permanently to the library or the multi-purpose room or mm -hmm. some yeah, different park, venue. Parker um, has a bigger parking lot. <laughs> true, true, yeah. Yeah, but it's so convenient so the people can walk. I mean, well, we're here, and I mean, it's convenient for us because we can walk. <laughs> the, you know, I mean, not that what we want matters. Right, but. right. Okay. Yeah, okay. So that's the update on that. 
There's really not much else to report since last Wednesday. Any feedback um, about um, our favorite new coffee coffee shop, Perfectos? Those are people crossing the street. I've heard that and it's horrifying. Um, well, the, the, the reason why I ask, uh, because I did, as I was across the street in the other coffee shop, um, I did, I sat and watched, um, I think, I forget what day it was, um, uh, but as the, the parking lot was full, people, just as we knew was going to happen, people trying to back up off that you know there's a space where everyone has to back up and then people pulling in and then people pulling in one way and then there's no spots and you know it's actually it's, it's exactly only in miniature the same issues as at bagel world right where it has the sort yeah, of the, the horse the loop in yeah. front and the except that at least in bagel world you can <coughs> drive in and all well but the comment things. from my daughter the other day was that they were trying to get stuff at bagel world and all of the parking spaces were empty, but the line at, from the drive-thru prevents you from getting right, into the empty yeah. spots. Yeah. Oh, no, I it know. Is. It's, it's, yeah. it's yeah. impossible. Well, it's you can see the spots you want to park in, but you yep. just can't, you can't get, get there. That yeah. brings up the point that I asked before. Is at what point do you look at a site plan and you say, you say no, and you tell somebody they can't do anything on, on a lot. Mm -hmm. Like you're telling a business they can't open there, and that, does the town really want to start doing that? Because yeah, I mean, be, uh, right, that's the thing. <laughs> I mean, we could, uh, we could have all, one, all of us that were, uh, were probably somewhat involved back then, too, <laughs> some way, um, uh, saw that there was yeah. going to be a traffic issue there. Totally. We did the best we could, um, you know. Well, um, the, it's the wrong thing. It's the wrong it's not necessarily the wrong building, but it's sort of the wrong use on that parcel. So a whole bunch Which, of factors. I mean, the fact that the brook is back there, yeah, the building hasn't moved, right. and the limited land available, um, it's just, it was just tough. Anyways. But in, in terms of the uh, bagel world, I mean, is there nothing that allows us, that would allow the town to revoke the drive through permit? Again. You know. and if potentially that they shut the business for two years, a period of two years, somebody or more. starts getting killed on the roadway. I yeah, or, I mean, I really that's a good three. question. I really don't know the answer to. Um, we do have a provision now in site plan review that we could potentially drive them back through, like a minor site plan review to mm. try to fix the problems on the property. But that's triggered by them asking us for something, which they're not doing. <laughs> Um, well, but the, I mean, is there, is there not a separate permit for the drive through operation? Or is that only... Uh, so now we don't allow drive throughs on Main Street, but at the time they went in, I presume that it was allowed and it was just part of their original site plan approval or whatever that building used to be process that they went through with the town. They didn't, they just, you know, we, we have specialists that do operational improvements, operational efficiencies, and they can look at anything and tell you what you're doing wrong and make it work. I bet you that if they spent the money on some consulting, they could figure out how to make that queue move. Right. And that might solve the problem. Uh, however, well, however, I do get a sense that it's, uh, there's an infinite demand. So you right. make the queue move, there's gonna, and suddenly there's no queue there's going to be more people that show, possible, show up because yeah. that's what you hear. Right. Oh, I didn't yeah, go well, because I couldn't pull in. The three times I've tried to drive yeah. there, I have not ended up going there because yeah. I can see where I want to park and I can't I know. get in. I know. It's, look, it's a successful mm. business. So, right. It's yeah. what we right. want. Right. Um, well, but, but I'm, <laughs> I always just walk there now. It's unfortunate, but it's, it's what we want. So, uh, Yeah, but the, the question, I mean, there's, if there's enough uh, disruption slash violation of something mm -hmm. is there a point where the town has the uh, leverage to change it you know what's the deal with the um, car wash they have a detail out there at times of a police officer, right and right? Bagel world used bagel to as world. well yeah and they yeah. still do they the they police now do. on yeah. sunday mornings they put up cones and you cannot turn the left. police do the police do yeah. they and put right. up cones and you can't pull turn left the into bagel world the taxpayers pay for that although walk. i don't know the answer to that it, yeah, I mean, I mean potentially if you start making them pay for that service, well, yeah. they might yeah. reconsider what they're doing. But. Um, 
house. And I know the police have spent countless hours. Yeah. Working I know. With so the re the reason why I brought that up wasn't necessarily yeah. because Baker World, because that's that's it, that's mm -hmm. out of our hands, definitely. Um, but just interested in what's happening. You know, if that same condition is going to start happening at, at Perfectos, mm -hmm. um, but also because at one point a yeah, five years ago or so, we talked about a um, an improved pedestrian crossing, whether it was there or whether it was a, just a little bit south of um, of, Bay, of Minot, the, Minot yeah. Street, yeah, right. um, but somewhere in there right. so that people, you know, had some safe way to cross. And um, I think that was before the advent of those Hawk um, crossings like we have, right? We installed one over by um, by REI. Um, but um, I we not, talked about it for a while and then it sort of disappeared. Well, it's we, been put back on the radar with the state, that same question right, about the yeah. pedestrian crossing yeah. for the same right. reason. You're not the first person to be reminding okay. town staff about right. it. Um, and I think just last week it was sent to the state as something we need to look at when they're looking at repaving and then um, getting the road diet funded, like put on the tip and yeah, funded. Right. And, and a number of different things, a curb cut analysis on South Main Street, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. improvements to for the intersections along South Main Street. So they're looking at a number of things and that's been added into the right. mix. Um, right. I don't have any hope that that's gonna be something that happens soon. Well, there, I mean, there is a crosswalk there. Uh, it's not signalized. But there is a crosswalk with a with a big yellow sign. Yeah, can you I mean, it's like because raised crosswalks? No, that? they just have like a, you have um, um, a hand. You know, you have a signalized and the lights. Um, right, that's what's oh, at behind Bedford Square. Yeah, I forget what Hawk stands for. Doesn't it stand High. for something? Uh, yeah. High visibility. High visibility. High visibility walking. Yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. and then it's um, different flashing and. Yeah, and so it just it just it lights up. Yeah, is basically flashes on the it street does. as well, right? It may yeah mm -hmm. flash on the street yeah. and then flash. And there's a learning the curve, a big learning curve with those mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, to get so drivers to. Andrew's meant to sit out there on the <laughs> just press it and not cross. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but that because there's a there is a there is a. Um, crosswalk there but it's barely visible well yeah. and, it's right. also and if you were to walk and no one would stop no 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 yeah. you take your and it, it, and, and it, if i remember right it's one of the ones that doesn't really meet the code because the it's too close to a driveway on the uh, yeah. eastern side of, of main street yeah which is one of the barriers we had talking about in the first place yeah right So yeah, it has, the issues there have been right. brought up. It's like the second bank of world <laughs> for the police, you know. Yeah. It's like, now we don't just have one, we have two. <laughs> So, well, the good news, if anything, is that they're next to each other. <laughs> so the, the traffic. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Down you don't have time so, to yes. speed up between them. Them. No, right. You have to yeah. slow down the way up. Yeah. Right. 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 Well, yeah. eliminate one travel lane and just make it parking. <sighs> Get rid of that stupid bike lane on that side. <laughs> the road diet. Well, that's the road diet. Parking line, right. from <laughs> South Street all the way to Washington Street. I'm trying take to care revive of the road problem. diet. How many parking spaces from South Street to Washington Street? Think about that. Actually, a lot of Is that really what we want? <laughs> it's it's a traffic town calming. <laughs> traffic calming and it solves the parking problem. Yeah. Uh, if people okay. want to. Move to adjourn. Yeah. <laughs> I'll second that. All in favor? Yeah. Okay. <laughs>